thought we would get here. Not only am I asking myself this question as we find ourselves in the season one finale of the Church History Project, but the question reminds me of those scattered Jewish communities in the first century, settled across the vast Roman world. Did they ask themselves the same? Little did they know then that their far-flung presence was no accident, but rather part of God's providential plan, a pivotal piece of context for the events unfolding in ancient Rome and Judea. And so, at this season's end, we'll stand to see how God directed history to this point, just as he guides his purpose still. The closing of one chapter leads but to the opening of the next. Where will his sovereign hand lead as this story continues? My name is Jared Luchibor, a graduate of Mid-America Reform Seminary and a lover of church history. Join me as we look at the scattering of the Jews in the first century and visit the build-up to 70 AD and the countdown to one of the greatest catastrophes in Jewish history in the season one finale of the Church History Project. In the centuries leading up to and during the time of Jesus, the Jewish people were spread far and wide across the ancient world in what is known as the diaspora, from the Greek word meaning dispersion. Though their spiritual homeland remained the region of Judea, the center of their faith and identity, the majority of Jews did not actually reside in the area. Vibrant communities of the Jewish diaspora thrived from Mesopotamia to Rome itself. This diffusion of the Jewish populace was largely the result of exile in eras past, but though separated from their ancestral soil, these dispersed Jews retained their rituals and beliefs. Whether in Judea or the farthest corner of the Roman realm, the diverse Jewish communities represented a resilient people, their common identity and faith transcending any physical dispersal. Alexandria, the Egyptian city by the sea, was home to a thriving Jewish population who made their mark on the intellectual and cultural life of that storied metropolis. Likewise, the great Syrian city of Antioch housed a substantial Jewish community, as did Ephesus on the coast of Asia Minor. The creation of Jewish quarters in these cities arose in part from a longing to uphold cultural and religious identity, seeking to safeguard their customs, dietary laws, and religious rituals, the Jewish people were drawn together into tight-knit groups. Within these close communities blossomed a shared commitment to maintaining age-old traditions passed down through generations. Though their customs and rituals forged tight bonds within the Jewish community, these same traditions often erected barriers between them and their Gentile neighbors. Clinging to the ways of their ancestors while resisting the adoption of local conventions, the Jews were sometimes viewed as standoffish and aloof. This perception of exclusivity brewed tensions, leaving the Jews outcasts in the eyes of the Gentiles, who saw their rejection of common practices as antisocial behavior. Yet the Jews persisted in observing their heritage faithfully, prioritizing the continuance of their people over assimilation. Though adherence was widespread, not every member of the Jewish community observed their tradition without exception. In that ancient Mediterranean port city of Alexandria, home to a sizable Jewish community, some Jews sought to harmonize their faith with the prevailing Hellenistic culture. Of these syncretists, the most illustrious was the philosopher Philo, who lived around 20 BC to 45 AD. Seeking to build a bridge between the ancient wisdom of his Jewish heritage and the rational speculation of Greek thought, Philo of Alexandria pursued a life's work of creative reconciliation. He also attempted to utilize the concept of logos to explain the relationship between God and the world. Philo employed the Greek term logos, which means word or reason, to signify the radiant divine force that bridges the chasm between the transcendent God and the material realm. For Philo, logos embodied wisdom, the law, and the consummate ideal of humanity itself. He envisioned logos as God's premier creation, the chief among angels, thus appointing it as the mediator through which God created the cosmos and gave revelation, 
Moreover, Philo supposed that the human intellect innately reflects Logos, bestowing upon people the faculty of apprehending and uniting with the divine through reasoned contemplation. Philo's concept of Logos interweaves strands from both Hebrew and Greek thought. He finds inspiration in the Old Testament's exaltation of the word and wisdom of God, which summons forth creation and orders the cosmos. Passages such as Genesis 1 verse 3, where God speaks light into being, reveal the generative potency of divine speech. Psalms and Proverbs praise the Lord's wisdom, which established the heavens and earth. According to Philo, these biblical ideas resonate with aspects of Platonic and Stoic philosophy. From Plato, Philo borrowed the theory of the eternal ideas, which serve as perfect models for earthly things. From the Stoics, he adapted the idea of an animating rational principle steering the course of nature. In his conception of the eternal word, we find echoes of the Christian doctrine of Christ as the only begotten Son of God. Yet, Dr. Nick Needham notes that while some early Christians were eager to claim Philo as one of their own, converted to the faith, the truth is that there is no evidence Philo ever encountered or acknowledged Jesus of Nazareth. Philo's usage of the word logos is the vocabulary of Middle Platonism encountering Hebrew wisdom. The language of the Gospel of John is far different. In the opening verses of chapter 1, we read, In the beginning was the Word, Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Though there may have been historical antecedents to John's conception of the Logos, the Apostle tailored his application of the term to align precisely with the person of Jesus Christ. John's employment diverges markedly from any prior usages. The divine word issues forth to create and give revelation, and that word has now taken human form, thus the person of Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man. Where pagan philosophers spoke abstractly of an impersonal Logos, John discerned its true identity in his living Lord and Savior. Far more prevalent than Hellenized Jews were Gentile converts drawn to the Jewish faith. Given the name God-fearers, these were non-Jewish individuals who, beguiled by Judaism's monotheism, affiliated themselves with Jewish congregations but stopped short of total conversion. These God-fearers would join their Jewish neighbors in synagogue worship and revere the moral code set forth in scripture. However, by declining the rite of circumcision, they maintained a certain distance, one which left them caught between two worlds. To the Jewish community, uncircumcised yet faithful, these God-fearers posed a quandary. Their attendance at services and appreciation of righteousness showed sincerity of spirit. Yet their refusal of circumcision conveyed an incompleteness of commitment. Torn between welcome and wariness, Jews struggled to reconcile open arms with unmarked flesh. So the god fears occupied a middle ground. Their place in the community remained ambiguous, faithful yet foreign, devout yet uninitiated. The god fears appear throughout the New Testament, probably none more exemplary than the centurion Cornelius, who, as we read in Acts 10 verse 2, was a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. Yet, as a Roman officer, he refrained from circumcision and the stern obligations of the Torah. The remainder of Cornelius' tale will reserve for another time. For now, suffice it to say that his fascination with the Jewish faith as a God-fearing man prepared the soil of his heart to receive the seeds of the gospel message. During the time of Jesus, the ancient city of Babylon in the Parthian Empire contained a thriving Jewish enclave. Descendants of the Judean captives settled there after the Babylonian conquest centuries earlier, now numbered in the tens of thousands. The Jewish community prospered under the Parthian Empire's rule, practicing their faith and customs in peace. Yet tension simmered beneath the surface between Rome and Parthia, arch-rivals whose empires were divided by the Euphrates. 
In their wartime machinations, the calculating minds in Rome spied opportunity in the extensive Jewish communities under Parthian rule, arousing Roman suspicions. Rome questioned the political loyalty of the Jews within their own Judean homeland, perhaps believing sympathies leaned towards Parthia. This atmosphere of mistrust only inflamed tensions in the occupied land of the Jews. Parthia's looming menace did little to temper Rome's heavy hand in Judea. The Jews chafed under the grinding weight of Roman taxation and control. Resentment seethed, awaiting a spark to set alight the fires of rebellion. The stage was set with the fate of Jerusalem hanging treacherously in the balance, awaiting its prophesied demise in the year 70 AD. The question that remains is what will become of Christ's newfound church in this pivotal moment in world history? As we reach the finale of this inaugural season tracing the context of our Christian faith, we see a people prepared yet unaware of the seismic shifts soon to come. God patiently tended the soil over long years, through exiles and returns, diaspora and gatherings. Now, flames of resentment kindled in occupied Judea, factions vying for power and influence. Yet in the fullness of time, a voice cried out proclaiming good news of great joy for all people. As foretold by prophets of old, from this tiny corner of the Roman world emerged a message to turn all of history on its head. The stage was set for the spread of good news. As we advance to season two, we will witness the launch of a movement that boldly carries the gospel beyond Jerusalem to the farthest reaches of the known world. We will see the faith birthed in Judea shake the foundations of mighty Rome, and we will discover that even death itself cannot contain the explosive power of the resurrection, the bedrock of all of church history. As modern listeners, we stand as heirs to this rich legacy that originated in ancient Judea yet spans the globe today. We too are invited to find our place in this story and walk in the love and grace shown to us in Jesus Christ. May we reflect deeply on the roots of our faith as we look back upon this season. And may we prepare our hearts anew for the story still to come. Get ready to encounter the Jesus movement, the spread of the gospel outside the ruins of fallen Jerusalem in 70 AD, the apostolic fathers, and the ways God turned the world upside down in just decades. That concludes Season 1 of the Church History Project podcast. Thank you so much for investing your time to listen and learn about the historical context of our faith. And this was only just the beginning. As we bring this first season to a close, I'm excited about what lies ahead. In the coming months, we'll be back with a whole new lineup of church history stories to explore. From the earliest proclaimers of the gospel, the first imperial persecution under Nero, the destruction of Jerusalem, and the introduction to the apostolic fathers, the first Christian leaders and teachers after the apostles. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app. And if you enjoyed today's discussion, consider leaving a review or engage in the Church History Project Facebook group. The link is in the show notes. I'm Jared Luchibor, and remember, Wherever you are on your journey of faith, it's stories like these that remind us how we got here and why it all matters. Thanks for tuning in to The Church History Project.